The UEFA Euro 1968 was a year marked by novelty and unpredictability, a far cry from the polished tournaments we cherish today. The qualification process involved teams from across the continent battling for a coveted spot in the event. In contrast to the expanded format we know now, only four teams made it to the finals in 1968, setting the stage for intense drama from the very first kick. Italy, the tournament host, faced off against the formidable USSR in their inaugural match. The Soviets had reached the finals in the previous two editions, adding an extra layer of anticipation. The other two semi-finalists were the reigning world champions, England, and a Yugoslavian team considered among the greatest in the sport's history. Despite being debutantes, Italy already had history with the USSR, having been eliminated by them in the qualifiers four years earlier. The Soviets were once again the favorites, a sentiment echoed by Italian coach Ferruccio Valcareggi, who acknowledged that his opponents were not unbeatable, emphasizing the daunting challenge ahead. Italy had additional reason to be cautious, having been eliminated from the World Cup two years prior by a confident USSR team. The Italians found encouragement in the injury concerns plaguing the USSR leading up to the game. Igor Chislenko, the talismanic figure whose goal had sealed Italy's fate in the 1966 clash, would play no part for the Soviets. Napoli's San Paolo Stadium set the stage for a fiercely contested match, played under torrential conditions that added an extra layer of challenge to the game. Gianni Rivera and Sandro Mazzola, orchestrating the tempo, grappled with the adverse weather in the Campania region. As expected, the harsh conditions contributed to the physicality, with a particularly brutal collision between Valentin Afonin and Gianni Rivera, forcing the Milanese player off the field. The blow to Italy didn't end there. Injuries continued to mount. Giancarlo Bercellino suffered a knee injury in extra time, prompting Angelo Dominguini to shift to left back and unsettling the Italian backline. Unsurprisingly, the Soviets seized control, earning six consecutive corners just before halftime. In this challenging scenario, Dino Zoff's prowess as a goalkeeper came to the forefront. Zoff made crucial saves, denying Albert Shesternev and thwarting Alexander Lenev twice, who took advantage of Rivera's injury with strategic movement. The game didn't head to penalties, introducing an even more tension-filled resolution. The victor would be determined by a coin toss, a method employed for the first and only time. Italy's captain, Giacinto Facchetti, vividly recalls the moment that held his nation's fate. I went up with the Russian captain. We went down to the dressing rooms together, accompanied by two administrators. The referee pulled out an old coin, and I called tails. It was the right call, and Italy was through to the final. Racing upstairs, my celebrations informed the 70,000 fans still waiting in the stadium that they could rejoice in an Italian victory. In the other semi-final, England, the World Cup holders, faced a formidable Yugoslav side led by the legendary Dragan Zajic, hailed by Pele as the Balkan miracle, a real wizard, and dubbed by the Brazilian legend as the most natural footballer he'd ever seen. De Zajic had dazzled in Euro 1960 with his mesmerizing runs and unpredictable dribbling, gaining acclaim from fans across Europe. Sir Alf Ramsey's cautious team selection mirrored England's approach employing a tactical setup still common in the English side today. Two ball winners anchored a five-man midfield behind the lone striker, Roger Hunt. Despite a depleted squad, England fought hard, creating opportunities including Alan Ball's header against the bar, though offside, and a wasteful shot after a clever move. In the semi-final, Zajic's brilliance shone, leaving the 1966 FIFA champions struggling to contain his wing play. Zajic's exceptional dribbling combined with his physical prowess led to a sublime goal, cushioning a long ball, beating three defenders with sleight of foot and calmly finishing past Gordon Banks. The final, held with a late kickoff in Rome at 10.15 p.m., introduced an unconventional development. An Italian team, physically drained en route to the final, were once again cast as underdogs. Yugoslavia, appearing fresher and sharper, took the lead through Zajic late in the first half, capitalizing on tidy build-up play. Anxious Italian fans rallied behind their team in the second half. 
the Azuri, fueled by their supporters, fought back, earning a free kick in the 80th minute. Angelo Dominguini rifled the ball into the net, igniting a rapturous celebration among the Tifosi. Extra time unfolded with Yugoslavia regrouping and creating two glorious chances, both thwarted by Dino Zoff's heroics. With the sides level after two halves of extra time, a replay was chosen as the method to determine a winner. A twist that would seem ludicrous in today's football landscape, marking the first and only such conclusion in a major international tournament. For the replay, Italian coach Ferruccio Valcareggi overhauled his lineup, implementing five changes just 48 hours after the initial clash. Valcareggi aimed to match Yugoslavia in power and pace, sensing an opportunity as the Yugoslavians appeared fatigued. Yugoslavia, visibly depleted, even saw Dragan Zajic, usually exceptional, having what could be termed a shocker. Tarsisio Bergnik, a renowned right-back, had an uncomplicated outing this time, and Mirsad Fazlagic tried his best with overlapping throughout the match. Luigi Riva, returning from a broken leg, made a timely comeback for Cagliari. Despite some technical rustiness leading to missed chances, he was better rested than his Balkan counterparts. After several squandered opportunities, Riva found his rhythm when a miscued shot from Dominguini fell to him. In the twelfth minute, he expertly controlled and struck a left-footed effort into the far corner, putting Italy ahead after a hatful of missed chances. In the replay, Yugoslavia, worn out and struggling to find a response, saw their hopes dashed early on. The recently departed Pietro Anastasi, hailed by many as the man of the match, left an indelible mark on this encounter. His crowning moment arrived in the 30th minute, a display of sheer genius. As the ball rolled towards him, Anastasi flicked it up, executed a perfect turn, and volleyed from outside the box. The Italians sailed through the game, with Dino Zoff encountering minimal trouble against a Yugoslav side that had been thoroughly exhausted. The Balkan team, lacking depth, lamented their missed opportunities, a sentiment echoed in Dragan Zajic's retrospective frustration. Some excellent teams were behind us, but against the home side, we were in a subordinate position due to a higher power. The referee Dienst was the Azuri's twelfth man, and they won only due to his help. Zajic, poised to be the standout player in Euro 1968, found the Azuri rising and responding on their home turf. No player exemplified an iron will to resist defeat more than Dino Zoff, the goalkeeper whose resilience instilled a sense of calm even as thousands of Italians nervously watched.